Okay, so uh, I don't know if you have uh, read online, but this today's lecture will be in English. So we'll try to to make it for international audience on YouTube and see if uh, other people will watch it. So the topic of today's lecture is hiring developers demystified. I'm Mario Živić, I'm co-founder of uh, Testdom, uh, together with uh, Željko Svedić here, who is a founder of Gembox as well. So these are two, let's say, sister companies. So uh, let's see how, uh, how we will do do this presentation about hiring developers. So we'll look at uh, two sides of the hiring process, on the candidate side and the company side, and how the candidates pre prefer to present uh, their skills, how companies prefer to assess uh, candidates, and what's wrong with all of that. And then we'll present uh, the best process that I've managed to identify. Basically, it's uh, created by data science guys for hiring data scientists, but it works well for software developers as well. And in the end, I'll uh, quickly show what Testdom does in this space because one of these two companies is helping with hiring software developers. So the first segment is candidate's perspective. So from candidate's point of view, how do I prove I'm good without any effort on my side? Because candidates typically apply to, to many positions and they don't want to spend hours and hours on every application. So uh, one first thing, I already have a computer science degree. What more do you want from me? So first question that I'd like to ask is like, would you hire all of your classmates from, the univer from your university classes? I know I wouldn't and they have the same degree as I do. So obviously not, not a good idea. Additionally, Stack Overflow developer survey says that around 50% of professional developers don't have a computer science degree. So basically you are already focusing on half, like it's already half of the people who are developers who don't have a CS degree. So it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it, it isn't worth much. The last point is that based on this uh, also Stack Overflow developer survey, the way how developers acquire knowledge and skills is mainly through self-learning and on-the-job learning as two main points and only about uh, formal education is only on the third place. Actually any kind of education including online classes and stuff like that. So basically from a candidate's perspective, just by you having a CS degree it doesn't mean much because it's not, it's not something that, it, it is a positive signal, but it's not uh, something that immediately qualifies you to be a good developer. The next one, okay, here's my full resume. You can find here all my experience and everything. Who has the best resumes? Marketing and salespeople. Why? Because re writing resumes is marketing yourself towards other people and selling yourself uh, to, to the companies. Who has even better resumes? People who lie. And who lies on the resumes? Everyone, to a different degree. 100% resumes don't say anything negative about the candidate. So that's all of our resumes. 80% of resumes contain misleading statements, mostly exaggerating one's impact. Especially you worked on a team project and you made your sound like that your role was much bigger and more important than it actually was. 50% resumes contain pure lies. In case of college students, because they have really big problems writing stuff in resumes because they don't have much experience, this stretches to 90%, the amount of pure direct lies. And if you think that it's only students, former Yahoo CEO was fired due to lying about having computer science degree on his resume. So like it's not, it's not limited to only uh, college grads. Result, recruiters and hiring managers reduce what you claim by 30%. These, these old data cam, came from a career builder a research uh, in the United States. So these numbers are not like that I pulled from, from thin air. So basically, one other point regarding resumes, which is 
maybe more important for uh, when you're applying for international companies than looking purely in Croatia is who will read your resume because it's not always people who are reading. If you have applicant tracking systems who are basically reading your resume, they prefer long keyword rich resumes, exactly the opposite of what people prefer. Humans prefer short resumes, but with their favorite sections and format. So there, is countless, there are countless uh, stories about uh, recruiters, hiring managers, HR people who just don't want to consider resume without a picture. There is another who don't want to consider resume with a picture because that opens them for a lawsuit in the United States. And there is like whatever you want. There is a, a, also a data point from career builder research that 30% of recruiters will reject a resume that doesn't include a list of skills section. I never wrote a list of skills section on my resume. Like I, I never thought that this is, section is important. And apparently 30% of recruiters like it because it's easier for them. They just check, check this section alone and ignore everything else. So basically, you can see here why resume is also not, not a good uh, method for presenting your case because, okay, here this might sound like you, you should lie as well on your resume, you shouldn't, but uh, <laughs> the problem is that many people will. Then another popular among developers, here's my GitHub profile, you can see everything there. But how many of you who are developers actually have an active public GitHub profile? Okay, how many of you are developers here? Okay, so 60, 70%. Uh, how many of you have an active GitHub profile? Two hands and he's lying. <laughs> I know him, so. <laughs> uh, and then, even if you have GitHub profile, what is the chance that your best work is on your public GitHub profile? Majority of the software development is done uh, for propri proprietary code as owned by companies and is not published in open source. And another, pro another problem related to the previous with the exaggeration of one's impact, if it's a group project that you worked on, how the hell am I supposed to find your most important contribution to this project among this forest of commits and everything? I can look the quality of the whole project, but if it was team effort, how do I assess uh, your contribution there? One funny point. This is a GitHub profile of this guy, Tom Preston Werner. And can you guess what his most important uh, project in his life was from his GitHub profile? He's co-founder of GitHub. <laughs> and there's nothing here indicating that he's co-founder of GitHub, that he was former CEO of GitHub, and anything like that. So basically, looking at GitHub profiles themselves, not much to, to say like that. So basically, from candidate's point of view, what I wanted to summarize, there's no easy way where you don't have to do any work, and it's all just there. Companies should do more on their side to, to figure out if that I'm good or something like that. So now let's look quickly on the company's uh, perspective. So companies don't, are not so much worried about time, they're worried about cost. So how do we assess candidates cheaply? So in the matter of fact, they actually try to use the same things. So we only hire people who have a CS degree. So as we already said, CS degree is only the third most common source of knowledge for developers. 50% of developers don't even have a CS degree. CS degree is definitely a positive signal, so it, it means something, but it's not a good as a standalone filter. So when, when you have two candidates who are tied in every other sense and then one has a CS degree and another doesn't, then, you, then it's reasonable to use it as an as a, like extra edge for this candidate, but to use it as a filter initially like HR does. Oh, this guy comes from a mathematics study. No, we only hire computer scientists, like useless. And true story in the same time. <laughs> uh, and also there is like, like an active uh, things like Teal, the Teal Fellowship, which gives $100,000 to young people who want to build new things instead of sitting in classroom. And now with the inflation of prices uh, for universities in the United States, 
uh, more and more discussion is being held about how valuable is the university education for, for many things in software engineering world in general. So one, one thing, like if you go on google.com about careers, how we hire, and there is a section frequently asked question, do I need a computer science degree to be a Google software engineer? No, it's not needed. So basically even Google, who used to hire only post-grad students, so masters and uh, PhDs, they actually don't require a CS degree at all anymore. So even they realize that, that it doesn't make sense. So the next way how companies typically want to help uh, their recruiters is we only hire candidates experienced with our stack. We don't have time to train them. They will stay with us for only six to nine months or maybe one or two years or something. So we don't want to teach them because we cannot make up for this education time. The question with experience is what kind of experience? Is it more and more complex stuff doing, like that candidate has been doing more and more complex stuff over three years? Or, is he, or was he doing the same stuff over and over again for 10 years? Because I don't want to point fingers, but in many agencies, you are basically doing this. You are doing the same, same like web app or mobile app just for different, different, different client, and it's always the same level of complexity and stuff. Again, there are exceptions, but if you are working on a company which is uh, with which is building a product which is evolving and becoming bigger and bigger and more complex and scales more, it's more common that you are actually growing within this role. But in order to figure out, you need to, it's not, like, it's not easy to read from a resume which kind of experience candidate has and it, comparing number of years doesn't make sense because sometimes two, three years of experience can be much more than 10 years of, of same experience. Then how much experience, even if you want experience, how much experience you want? The research says that after six to 12 months of initial uh, experience with some technology, there is no correlation between additional years of experience and skill level for, for that technology. You either got it or you won't. So that's uh, typically with software development, whoever worked with multiple multiple different uh, technologies understand that the core knowledge is not actually understanding the APIs of specific framework or library. It's more about knowing how to think uh, and being able to tell the computer to, to do this on the level of abstraction that computer prefers. And then a joke line, are you one of those looking for 20 year olds with 20 years of professional experience? Which many times you, you, you see in some uh, poorly written job posts. One, one slide that I have from 2016 when I, when I did this uh, lecture initially and I didn't have time to, to uh, update it today is actually I was looking at AngularJS. This is Google Trends Graph. So it was, uh, it was middle of 2016, am I right? 2000, yeah, 2016. And the Angular was like three years old. And I went on, uh, sorry, I went on career, uh, career Builder uh, website looking for Angular JS developer. And I, took, I just opened the first 10 job posts that opened up. The first asked for seven years of Angular experience. The second asked for five years. Two asked for three years. And one asked for two years of experience. And you can see for this graph that almost no one had more than two, three years experience because it didn't exist before. <laughs> so, but still, the job posts uh, requiring experience and a recruiter sitting there and checking boxes if this candidate's pass or fail, use this experience number as a, as a rule. So then again, uh, there are Silicon Valley companies who really like GitHub and they again say we only hire candidates with strong GitHub profiles. I have two guys for you. One is Tomek Czajka from Poland, who is a flight software engineer at SpaceX, doesn't have a GitHub. And another is Luka Kalinovic from Croatia, who is a, one of the team members for core Google search algorithms. So just a couple of them who, who work on this very core Google feature. And his GitHub profile contains of 
<laughs> three pet projects that he was working on at some moment in his life. So none of them have their most important work, their highest quality development and anything. They, you cannot get uh, that impression by looking at their GitHub profiles. But I'm pretty sure that you would be extremely happy if you had any of these two guys on your team, if you have interesting job for them. <laughs> and now we are moving to the company's uh, other policy, which is we give them a project to do at home. This is becoming more and more common, but there are a number of problems with that as well. So first of all, a uh, majority of good developers already have good jobs. So, and you are giving them a project to do at home. Majority of good developers who are experienced enough, have, uh, have like five to 10 years of experience, also have families and probably small kids because there's very few developers who are already close to retirement with adult kids. So what you actually test is their motivation to, to, to apply for, for work at your company. But it's a bit too early in the process if you actually use this before interviews, before, before everything. So even though you're giving them a sample of actual work, which is a good way to test candidate, you risk that a lot of candidates we, uh, will fall out, either by not being like, willing to, to take that time from them, or they will interpret it as doing the work for you free of charge if it's too, too similar to actual work. There, there are multiple stories in the design space where a candidate doesn't get a job, but their idea uh, presented on an interview magically comes to life as a, as a product. So I, I don't know if this story is, uh, is common in Croatia or not, but <laughs> it, was, it was mentioned uh, on Hacker News uh, multiple times. So again, for companies, there's no cheap nor easy way. If you try to, to use this low cost, problem, low cost solutions, you end up with the same problems as candidate do, or if you try to shift too much work on the candidate side, they, the good ones lose interest because good ones have good jobs already and have, uh, many of them have other things in life uh, which they are unwilling to sacrifice. Because it's never, one thing to keep in mind with hiring, it's never uh, one person, one company. Companies, pres companies like considering tens of candidates and when candidate is looking for, a, uh, for work, he's also, talking with tens of companies. So Im just imagine if 10 companies ask the same from this candidate in the same one or two months, would it be reasonable for him to, to take? And getting 10 projects done at home in, in a month or month and a half is something that probably no one would take. So, so let's now look at, at, a, at a better way. From my point of view, it's one of the best ways I've, I've seen uh, if you can dedicate it, uh, dedicate like your time and energy to, to do it in that way. As I mentioned, it's a data science style. Here is the link to the full article. So this slide, slides will be available online so you can look it up later. So the full article is here and it's very, very good read. So first, as a data scientist, they started by uh, defining what are the goals of, a of our hiring process. The goals of what we want of this process is to be accurate and reliable. So best candidates should always come out at the top. What are the best candidates? The definition of best candidates is specific from case to case. It's not always the highest skill guys. Sometimes it's... Uh, high skills within our budget, which is mostly always. <laughs> and uh, there are different things that you, want to, that you want to take into account. Someone who has to work with a, with a colleague who is like, I don't know, difficult in this or that way. Or, so you have to, there are many requirements what the best candidate for a specific position is. And this varies from case to case. Another rule is, another goal basically, is that it results with offer acceptance from the candidate side. So it doesn't matter that you selected a candidate as best if you give them an offer and they say, next. <laughs> so they just ignore you. So basically that selected candidates, that you maximize the chances that selected candidates will accept the offer. And it has to be efficient. So efficient on both sides. Companies should not spend too much time and money on candidates they consider and candidates should not spend a lot of time on companies they consider. 
So it's two-sided. Accepting this fact that candidate's time is also uh, something that you need to keep in mind. And now here's like a, a list of uh, list of selection criteria that they analyzed and also that that we analyzed uh, when we were when we were um, actually when Jelko was writing a book about uh, about hiring. So here is selection methods, reading resume, looking at GitHub profile, doing a uh, at home project, uh, having an interview with the candidate, doing general mental ability test or doing a work sample test. And here, here are those uh, criteria, accuracy, efficiency, cost to the company and cost to the candidate. We can see that reading resume has low accuracy, can be efficient if you do it with the like, resume screening tools, has low cost to the company and low cost to the candidate. So this, may, this is what makes them attractive, but this is what makes them bad. GitHub uh, profile, quite low with a lot of false negatives, meaning people who don't have GitHub profile are being placed as not being good enough because every developer should have a good GitHub profile, which is not true. It, has, it can have high efficiency, although I'm doubting this, Cost to the company is moderate because someone able to understand the code on GitHub needs to go through the GitHub to understand how this candidate uh, is his skill level. And cost to the candidate is low. So this is what makes it attractive. Everything else is not, not that great. Take it home project, high accuracy, high efficiency, uh, in, like in terms of reliability, reliability, moderate cost to the company, but high cost to the candidate. This is why it's attractive to the companies, but not attractive to the candidate. Having an interview, okay, here I need to disclaim it. There are made basically two groups of interviews. There is a structured interview and unstructured interview. They are very different things. Unstructured interview is like having a coffee. You just come with a candidate and you start talking. You talk about everything. You mention things which are relevant. You mention things which are not relevant. And then you leave with some impression. This is less reliable way of uh, doing interviews. Uh, structural, structured interviews are the ones where you think in advance what you will ask, and you ask the same, uh, all que uh, same questions to all candidates, and then you compare this uh, among candidates when you ask all of them the, the same type of questions. This is less common in practice because it requires serious preparation. You need to be very deliberate about what, what is important for this position and what will you ask of candidates. So let's say uh, looking at these two types, the lower part is always the unstructured, the higher part is the uh, structured interview. So accuracy is moderate to high, but it's always a bit subjective. You can never leave this subjective part out of an interview. Efficiency can be any, because interview can be five minutes or a whole day. Cost to the company is moderate to high. Cost to the con candidate, moderate to high. Again, there's many, many uh, like uh, costs here, but that's the reason why interview is typically done as a last step of the hiring process, not the first one. General mental ability test is on the other side quite good. It has high accuracy, high efficiency, low to moderate cost to the company, moderate cost to the candidate, but in United States, it's almost forbidden. <laughs> so uh, looking from the US perspective, it's not, not a go. Looking for uh, other, uh, other countries, it's probably something that you should, should, you should consider because there is, proven, uh, there is proven correlation between general mental ability. I'm not talking about the old style IQ tests, uh, numerical stuff, I'm talking about modern uh, like uh, Raven matrices, uh, abstract reasoning type of things, which which have high relevance with the high uh, correlation with the with job performance. And in the end, there is work sample test, which has high accuracy, high efficiency, but has can have low to moderate cost to the company and moderate cost to the con candidate if done properly. Typically, this is this is harder to achieve and that's why it was very rarely used it was mostly used as a project but we'll show you how how this was achieved to be 
uh, let's say, more moderate uh, in terms of uh, time from cost company and candidate. So the way how they looking into all this, looking into all this uh, analysis of the different selection methods, which they chose, uh, the data scientists guys, which methods they chose and in what order they applied them and how they applied them. So this is their process. The first step, check for a pulse and an email address. Nothing else, no reading resumes, no checking if they are willing to relocate, nothing, no discussions, no subjective things, no, no phone calls, nothing. Are they alive and do they have an email address? Next step, test for sufficient skill. This is, uh, this is the uh, works simple work sample test done remotely, uh, which lasts for like 45 minutes to one hour max, nothing more. Instead of like, if you, if you just go through the application form to apply for some position, it's already 20, 30 minutes. If you need to customize your resume, it's already one hour. So basically, one hour, 45 minutes to one hour is, is the maximum you should ask candidates upfront. But you, it's, your, like, um, it's your decision how you want to spend this one hour. So instead of having candidates fill some forms and write update resume, basically use this to test, do they know the bare minimum for this, uh, for this position? The next step after that, the, with the ones who pass, convince them to come to the trial day. So basically, it, this is a sales call. So it's not a, it's a recruiter calls you and tries to like sell you that this is the best company in the world, that this is the position that you will be happiest in, in your whole life and stuff like that. So it's no, not, not a call where they will ask you questions. It's basically a call where they will sell you this, uh, this prospect, this position, and where they will answer any questions or concerns that the candidate might have. And then, if, when the candidate accepts this trial day, then they try to test competence in a realistic, controlled environment and evaluate culture at the same time during this trial day. So this trial day is basically, let's say, in US it's a trial day because typically this candidate is nowhere near close to you. It's not like he lives in Zagreb and he can travel by Z 20 minutes to, to reach you. It's usually the candidate needs to take day off. So when they are taking day off, they probably can spend the whole day then here. In our case, it might be half a day or something like that. And then once this trial day is done, make a quick and definite decision. So no delaying, no we'll come back to you after we discuss with all other candidates. It's like here and there. On the team, uh, the, so okay, let me, let me actually uh, come step back and give you a bit more uh, details on this trial day. So the trial day, the idea is to do a full day's work of a, on, a, on an open-ended challenge. So basically not not very simple problem which has a clear end and then candidate solves it and, and then you don't know what to do else. Basically it's a problem which you can uh, work on for like as, as, long as, you, as, as long as you want. It is concluded with a, like some kind of a presentation of, uh, of the work done to the, to the team, to the group, which he will be joining if, uh, if he is offered a position and if he decides to join or she. So basically, this, uh, this is like a, some kind of presentation to the whole team. And then there is a question and answer section where, uh, where they, the, the whole team gets to ask whatever they want regarding this presentation. And basically, things like culture fit are tested along the way. How frequently candidates ask these questions? What kind of questions they ask? They went to lunch together. They had coffee. So they, they chit-chatted about uh, non-work related stuff. So, Within a day, you get this kind of uh, this this kind of better understanding. So basically, on this decision point, one thing that uh, the article highlighted is that uh, the reasons to when you should say yes and when you should say no for a specific candidate. Basically, if anyone on the team has a strong no, then it's a no. So everyone has a veto power, and if everyone is like so so, he can pass. If all of them are, if all people judge him like that, then it's a no-go. At least some person needs to think this guy is really great because of this and that. 
So this is like the, the rule of thumb that they, that they wrote. And then a couple of nice things to do is to follow up with every, every candidate. Recruiters follow up with every candidate who tried to apply for a position, but don't give them very detailed feedback in the end. But for every candidate who actually came to this trial day or interview, uh, the actual team members who, who were in touch with them, they, provide, they call them and they provide them feedback. They tell them what they did good, what they didn't do good. So this, this part of feedback is something that is like very seriously missing. It's mostly missing in US for legal reasons because it opens up a story for lawsuits uh, because they sue each other for anything in US, like in Zagori. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, by having this covered, so how can Tesdom help? So Tesdom is also a company helping in this uh, hiring process. And, uh, okay, let me come back. And especially we are trying to help to make work sample tests like low and moderate uh, in, in the cost to the company and candidates. So we know that it has high accuracy. We know that it has high efficiency. The only problem with, with work sample testing, uh, in general, work sample testing and GMA tests are the only scientifically proven methods uh, that to predict the candidate's uh, performance in job together with uh, structured interviews. So let's say these three. So interviews not as a category, but structured interviews as subcategory are also good. So these are the only three which make sense. Everything else is just pure rubbish. So TESDOM helps to make these work sample tests more cost efficient. So how do we do that? So basically, this is a place to test candidates for sufficient programming skills and now we are trying to expand to other skills as well. So which kind of skills we cover? We cover, we, we cover a wide variety of uh, programming skills. Here are grouped in categories. When you expand each of these, you get a bunch of other sub-domains. Sub but in general, it's database, JavaScript, PHP, C++, blah, blah, blah. Basically, we try to go with whatever is the not most popular in sense of uh, news coverage, but most popular in terms of actual developers existing who work on this technology and the job positions for technologies. And then, as I mentioned, we are significantly expanding into general tests. So we have here general numerical reasoning, verbal reasoning, and logical reasoning tests. These are these uh, general mental ability tests. There's project management, uh, quality assurance, data science, customer service, administrative assistant, accounting, and whatnot. So these tests, as I mentioned, are time bound. The typical tests that our users use are 30 to 90 minutes long with a stronger bias for this 30 to 60 minutes uh, range. Uh, they're relevant. So the questions are samples of actual work they will face in their job. So if you are applying for, for web developer, you will have to implement some JavaScript function in, which manipulates uh, document object model. If you are applying for PHP, you will have to uh, implement some, some backend uh, type, of, uh, type of function. So basically, it's, uh, it's always trying to, to test uh, what's, what's, uh, like what's typical for this type of, uh, what this type of work. The questions, uh, the questions we create are quite self-explanatory. So we are trying to minimize the need for, uh, for, uh, that candidates have for sub-questions and clarification. So, on interview, many times you ask a question and kind of, okay, what did you mean by that? Or is it this or that or something like that? So these kind of clarifications, this requires interaction. So it becomes expensive because every time a candidate is taking a test, some person needs to be there available to answer these questions. So we try to uh, have our questions as clear as possible to avoid this part. And the tests are also automated. So automated in two ways. Candidates get immediate feedback on their solution attempts. And companies get immediate feedback as soon as, comp as candidate completes the test. So this, this part here is quite, uh, quite important. Um, it's still quite common for, for many companies who are utilizing any kind of tests not to give candidates feedback during the, while candidate is solving the problem. They, they say things like, 
yeah, but in real life, they will not get the feedback. We want to see what is their best solution without their impact. The problem is that whatever we want to do, the actual testing process is not actual work. It's, the stress levels are much higher. You have time, this is like uh, running out. You, uh, it's a high, high risk um, task because it, based on the results of this task, it, uh, it can determine whether you will uh, get another interview or not and stuff like that. Because if you are working on your everyday job, you are not considering, will I lose my job if I do this like this or like that? You are not concerned over that while you are programming every day. I don't know, Domagoj, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, so let's see one one problem. So like I tried to choose the let's say something that everyone might understand and web development because web is something that we all understand. So some, probably web development will be clear to to everyone. So one simple problem, which is write a fac function append row that appends a table row to to the table with specific ID, and the appended row should have the same number of cells as the last row in that table. So you can see how this can be a very frequent task. Like you have a table of elements, you, you have a form to add one more element in a table, whatever, accounting software, anything that, that you are doing, whatever is web-based. So the candidate needs to find the table, dynamically understand how the last row looks like, and add one more row to that table and look at the score distribution. So these are the people who applied for jobs which required web development. Less than 33% is like, I don't know what, 50, 60% of people. So even the simplest problem. So there is a huge amount of people who, who claim to know things, who know to talk about things, but when it comes to actually doing things, this is where the problems begin. So basically, it, we, when we started with Tesdom, we started with uh, much more advanced questions, like uh, in order for a candidate to be good, we, he needs to know very complex stuff, very deep algorithms, uh, needs to be time efficient, memory efficient, and whatnot. And we went to three rounds of simplification of all of our problems until we came to the, what actually is needed on the market. Market needs, like, are you literate? Like, uh, like, this is basically the filter that candidate should have done in their head before they apply to this position. Read the job description. Can I actually do this? Yes or no? They don't do this. They apply for everything, and then you get this kind of score distribution. So this, the reason in this data science, uh, test for sufficient skill. So don't test for, for what you want of candidates to know, don't test for like some high level, we are a company who hires only the top people, we want to have very strong tests, no. At this point, early in the process, test like should they have applied? Just that, Not, nothing more than that. And this is, this is the part where, where, we help, where we help to make this very efficient, because what happens after this? If you use a test like this in the, as a first selection criteria, you eliminate more candidates who are not worth your time in that phase, which leaves you more time per candidate in a second phase where you can then, instead of calling them for 45 minute interview, you can call them for three hour interview and then get a bit much more details from the candidates who pass. Many companies consider like, but what if they cheat? It doesn't matter. The value of this testing is the, in the amount of red. You know that the ones who failed are definitely not good enough. From the ones who passed, you will figure out, as long as we eliminate the right people. So basically, if you try to use resume screening and any of the other methods, you filter on, uh, do they have a computer science degree? You have eliminated uh, good people by using this filter. People who have GitHub profile, you have again eliminated people who have good, who have good skill. If you use a question like this, you have eliminated only people who have no idea what you're talking about, because this is very simple stuff. So there's no web developer who cannot implement this. So one question, isn't this better? <laughs> so basically, I think that from uh, both from company side and from the candidate side, focusing, focusing on hard skills first, 
focusing on methods which are, which are easy for the candidate and for the company, but are high, high, highly accurate and highly efficient is much better way to do it instead of first having a call with HR, then doing a psychological testing, then doing a culture fit, and only then get the project at home to, to do and stuff like that. So basically, uh, this is, fr from my point of view, this is one of the best uh, flows that, uh, that I've seen. And the last, uh, last slide is if you need uh, advice or mentorship in, uh, in hiring or with, with anything related to, to software companies, Zelko is willing to help. He just suitably left the room before this slide. <laughs> so, but I introduced him at the, at the beginning. So feel free to get in touch with him. Uh.